Don't give me a chance to introduce you, Jason. I do not. I want to talk that. about your credits, all the movies you've done, Mudbound, which was incredible. <laughs> all those, so many. This is extraordinary to do uh, Ted Kennedy and in this in this story, which has never been told on the screen before, which is remarkable to me, considering it was 49 years ago, and now it's finally come to the screen. So my first question is, why now? Why do you think now is the time that's right to tell this? Well, this is right, and there's also, you know, Mark Chiardi was prepared to finance it and make the movie, you know. Um, uh, yeah, it's 50 years since Martin Luther King, it's 50 years since Bobby got shot. You know, Ted's been, you know, passed away for quite a while. Um, we made the movie heading into an election year, so it could have gone either way, you know, with the environment that's coming out, and could have been a Democratic president, you know, would that change anything, I'm not sure. Um, but there was a willingness to make it, you know, there was, you know, financiers that were ready to uh, put the money down that it would take. And then, you know, I was obsessed by it, and I wanted to make it, I wanted to make it. You did, when it came to you, was there any trepidation? You know, they're asking you to play an iconic figure in, a, certainly, in American life and, Amer and politics and everything. And yeah. That's I was just terrified. I was really terrified. <laughs> but, you know, you know this, uh, this is the same as an actor when you approach Shakespeare or Chekhov, or, you know what I mean? The part that truly scares you. Um, requires you know incredible dedication because you have to you have to put in the work and and, um, uh, and you know I knew that there's I'm either going to be accepted as Ted or I'm not and if I'm not the film is not going to work it's just such an intimate you know such an intimate uh, story and look at him and um, journey with him that uh, if we couldn't get it right and if I if I wasn't believable moment to moment um, I can say, having seen it twice and saw it cold the first time, not knowing what it was, except with the title, uh, when it was presented to me just before I saw it, uh, you come on screen and you go, uh, you sort of have that, okay, sort of prove it to me, and within two minutes, three minutes, I'm watching what I can totally buy as Ted Kennedy, and I don't think you're doing an impersonation. You're doing, thank you. <laughs> You're doing, you know, you're getting to the essence of him, and you're totally into the story, and 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 you are, you are that guy. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, I mean, you know, post the film, the day, it's such an interesting time to pick up the man. And I was always struck. There was these a series of photographs. Life magazine did a series of photographs on Ted. That was, you know. I think it was you know a year on from Bobby's death, and then there were some beautiful photographs of him at Hannesport, a very melancholic, you know, cardigans, the house, winter rain. You know, he looked like a you know a man who really was having a hard time. Um, and you know, and then we have of course this event and and his choices and, and the repercussions of that. But it's you know that, that first interview where John picks up the movie, we actually shot. We shot it. I don't know where they're coming from. I don't know what to tell you all, but we shot it. a one minute, a ten minute one take, which was supposed to be the opening scene of me walking up, you know, in Washington, coming out of an elevator, walking up the stairs, talking with AIDS, and, you know, and then going into that interview. So you actually saw the space. It was a ten minute shot that killed our steady cam operator. You know, we do it with one. So if anything happened, if somebody coughed or there's a move or somebody dropped something or I tripped or whatever, you know, let's do it again. You know, our city model was actually throwing up because it was so, you know, it's up three big flights of stairs at Boston Public Library. Um, but then John, you know, he, he put that away and you start with this interview with a man and it's based on a real interview of Ted sitting down the day, you know, of, the, you know, when he flew to high sport and um, he's talking about they're taking off the moon. Yeah. And, um, and I watched you know, the pre-roll to the interview, I managed to get hold of that, and you saw this man who, you know, suddenly he just, just, as you saw in the film, just quiet, trying to, trying to find his space, trying to take care of what he needed to take care of before he got on the plane to sail, you know, uh, what was originally Jack's boat, the Victoria. You know, yeah, so it's just, there's, there's so much in this history that leads to this moment, and I think, you know, 
And what's interesting too, how many people, I'm just curious in this audience, I'm gonna ask this question, how many people were aware of the whole Chappaquiddick incident and all of that, everybody? So they have come here to see this. Educated audience. Yes, 49 years, how many people didn't know? Okay, right here in the front. Because they came in late and they got the worst seats, okay. <laughs> it's interesting to me because the screenwriters here did not know what Chappaquiddick was. Yeah. And they're from Dallas, and they were interested in the Kennedy legacy, and they explored it, and they stumbled onto this. Young screenwriters who wrote this incredible screenplay, uh, you know, which is all based on facts. If you look it up on- Inquest, actually. It's based on, a lot of it is based on the inquest that was held behind closed doors under oath, because they never made it to a grand jury. So what would I say to the, five people that didn't know what chapter what it was. The, the importance of it right now, the relevance of this movie here in our world today. Well, I mean, look, there's, there's many things, and you know, we don't offer up one. But basically to look at, you know, so Ted was, you know, the Kennedys are heroes of mine. I believe in their policies and their politics. Um, I need to separate the person from the politics and the policies. And I need to look at the people that we vote for honestly, you know, uh, what's and all, and and leave what we need to leave behind, and then learn from the past and march into the future. Yeah, and showing that, and and in your um, approach to the uh, role here too, did you do any kind of physical transformation, and something that you felt you needed to do to put you into the role, or be believable in that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I had to get that accent right. I mean, that was the first one, and then their way of speaking. You may not have noticed it. That's brilliant. I think I've noticed something. Yeah, and John and I talked about a lot. You know, we, we never went full prosthetics or full, like, you know, let's, apart from, you actually don't see it, but I actually did the whole full face prosthetics of the old Ted. You only see my eye. But I had, I had a fat suit on, I had, you know, the makeup. It was a guy that does Saturday Night Live. It was extraordinary. You know, like, eight hour job with the makeup chair. It was beautiful, it looked really good, but John didn't think we needed the whole thing, so we just had the eye. Um, but so we ended up going for a week. You know, Ted had great hair. He had thick, beautiful hair that I've, you know, I've loved all that. <laughs> um, and then the teeth were very important. That was John, you know, that was, yeah, it was, it was his idea. Um, and we spent months with uh, K&B here in LA, uh, you know, so it's a dude making these teeth that I could slip on. You know, the first time too big to give that candy soft, my teeth are very small and crooked, and we just, you know, just get that, you know, so you, it was just one little thing that you see. I only see Ted smile a few times in the movie, but it's really important that it's there when it does come out. And, uh, and that was a great process, because it, it took so much effort to get them thin enough so that I could speak without a lisp. That's what I was wondering, how you yeah. did that tricky accent for you. Yeah. Teeth suck in your mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a for a long while there was a Ted, you know, with, with you know, teeth old, teeth old, for the teeth old. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> that's when I was very afraid. <laughs> no, <I> mean, <laughs> Did you go to Chappaquiddick? Yeah, uh, actually, to yes. that bridge. Yeah. Is it? Is it? Was then? Is it the same thing? It's now? still pretty similar. I mean, the bridge itself has got new wood. You know, it's a little bit wider, it's got some rails that have gone up a little bit higher, and, but there's still no markings as you go, it's a, it's a dirt road, there's not many houses that are built, being built or additions, there's no lighting still, there's no um, gate, or it's still on that angle, you know, as you come around it. Um, it's, you know, it's the edge of America, it's, it's, it literally is the edge of America, you know, the small little beach of a thin strip of land, and then the beach over there, and there's just nothing out there, there's, there's you know, the Atlantic. Um, and you dove in? I jumped in, yeah. yeah. Without the cameras rolling? Without the cameras rolling at night in April? It was cold. <laughs> That's <laughs> really scary cold. to me. What is scary? <laughs> <laughs> the, current, the current is actually a lot stronger than you see in the movie. When we shot that in the tank in Mexico, we couldn't get the jets to uh, give, the, give the strength to show it. It was a very strong current. You, you mentioned New Mexico. You, you actually shot the underwater scenes the and all of that yeah. stuff, and where Titanic, Titanic was shot, which yeah. is huge. I mean, it takes like a week to fill it. The famous Titanic tail, yeah. they call it. Yeah, yeah it goes down to 60 feet in, in a lot of parts. Yeah, it's wow. huge. And I went in, we, we actually put the car, I went in the car upside down, and we went under, 
um, dealing with a diver and then pulled me out and went wrong. Um, but we actually, you can't see that because we couldn't get, we couldn't get enough clarity with the camera, with the bubbles and the water and that coming in and, and, and the night time and, and, and the light. So you, there is a small shot where you can see my feet going out. But I'll tell you, that window was scary, going at 4 a.m. in the morning. Wow. With just one diver in the water to pull me out if I don't get up. Yeah, my heart was beating. <laughs> <laughs> Having done all this and actually more than anybody else, you know, experiencing what perhaps happened that night, do you have theories and things and what what was going through his head and, and, and that situation he suddenly found himself in. This movie makes him out to be a very real human being. We don't have our, we don't often see our leaders that way. Uh yeah. I mean, in the end uh, Wow, it's a, it's a poor question. But, um, I guess in the end, the theories don't interest me. At the end, the heart is the decision Ted made. And that's all, I mean, you know, drunk, womanizing, you know. I would like to think that if it happened to me, I would, and I couldn't save the guy, I would run to the nearest house, which was 50 meters away. And I would say, wake up, wake up, call the police. Maybe I wouldn't, I don't know. So those, those, those young boys who were on that train in Paris, you know? Yeah. And then even he, I thought what he said was remarkable. You know, I, I ran at the guy with the collision pop. Would I do it again? I'm not sure. You know, but, but you know, it's just one of those things. He did, he ran, and, and he honestly thought he was going to die, and, but he didn't. And you don't know until it happens. So, but I would hope I would run to the house and, and do the best I could to, to, you know, to save a woman that I knew was in a car. Um, well, that's the heart of it. He says at the end, one of, you know, one of my favorite lines is, you know, Moses betrayed, uh, Moses had a temper, Peter betrayed Jesus. I have a chapel queen. Yeah. You know, there's an acceptance of it. Yeah. And he did say in his book that, it, you know, he stayed with him and wanted him for the rest of his life. I gotta ask you about that scene, that speech that you do. Um, when he speaks to the people, uh, national audience, not just Massachusetts, yeah. was that word for word? Did you take that um, from? No, they speech? cut a few things because it's a very long speech. It's about a ten minute speech. You can watch it on YouTube. I mean, I didn't know it existed. It's on YouTube. It's it's um, yeah, watch it. See what you think. I mean, doing. You know, I mean, so I actually did learn it. <laughs> no, the whole speech. <laughs> oh, this is so many times. Uh, really? No, no, I learned this speech so many times. Um, it's a remarkable piece of thought. It's a remarkable performance of considering it was live. Everything's on the line. It's a remarkable piece of justification. I mean, even right at the very end, of, I mean, I was upset with some of the lines that John and the writers wanted in there, though. I said, you, you guys have got to put this in, there's so much you've got to put in there. I mean, you know, he quotes Jack and uh, Jack's book of moral courage. You know, um, you know, I mean, you know, you go back to what he said, what he quoted Bobby's speech at, 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 at the funeral, where he said, you know, in the end, history would, you know, we will, history will judge us all and we will one day surely judge ourselves. Um, there's, there's a level of consciousness in Ted and acceptance that I found in in what he was doing and what he was asking. I mean, he says, I ask, you know, I ask you to go, I ask your prayers and your thoughts, but in the end, the decision will be mine. So I mean, in a way, he's acknowledging that the speech is pointless. I'm gonna make my own mind up. So it's an appeal to, you know, there's so much, I mean, it's, you know, there's so much going on, I think. It was so interesting, though, I thought John Curran, who's the director of this movie, has done an incredible job in building it as a suspense thriller, even though you think you know how it ended. You don't really know. And you watch that, even that speech, which way is he, he going to go? You know, the well, yeah, but I guess in that way, it becomes with the people. In, in the end, ultimately, it's, I mean, as, as, a, as a viewer of this film, and I've seen it a few times, as a viewer, it's not just about Ted. And I guess that is the relevance of what you say, why now? You know, um, Somebody can only get away with what they can get away with. That's why we have the rule of law. Good, bad, politicized, kicked around, whatever we want to do with it. We do a lot with law. But, you know, and so I, that ultimately is where it rests. How do we feel? Yeah. You know, literally. Um, and, and in doing that, it's, it's extraordinary. Now, we're going to find out, because it's always interesting to see 
let an audience watch this film. You're the, one of the very first audiences to see this film. So let's see what you thought. If you've got any uh, questions, yes, you do right there. I'm going to call on you. Yes, right there. I just want to say you really just personified the character. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, that's it. Okay, yes. Uh, what happened to Rose in this story? Yes. Um, <laughs> there was actually, in the original scene, in the original script, there was one scene of her in the house. I mean, John, I can only speak for John and the writers. There's financial restraints. There's also, a, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing too. There's also this, the, a consideration to have the, you know, the main female focus be Mary Jo in terms of a presence to lead it with the male. Or, and then also uh, numbers and budgets and times and dates. And, you know, uh, you know John ended up cutting out a very tight film. But Rose was there. You actually, you know, you're right. And speaking of that, Joseph Kennedy played brilliantly by Bruce Stern with yes. almost yeah. no dialogue. And, um, and your scene with him, you know, that whole thing, and then the one line at the beginning, which we don't even see him on screen, but it, it's so powerful on the other side of that payphone. You remember payphones. On the other side of that payphone, saying alibi. Yeah, wow. Yeah. What was it like to shoot that stuff with him and uh, yeah, he's he's committed actor. I mean, he he filled me with fear. <laughs> you know, I mean, because he's he's watching you. He's, you know, he's he's at that part of his life that he's he's got nothing to prove. He's got nothing to. He's there because he wants to be. He's an actor. Be. He's there because you know. And a lot of guys didn't want to play that. You know, and I can understand. You know, um, and he's just he's just see him watching, you know, and it's funny because that, that everyone, you know, there was another thing that was criticizing, say, playing Joe is like, he's, he's so angry, he's a patriarch, he's this nasty, and I always thought of that moment of alibi of like, you know what, this, this old man has given three sons to his country, and he's just, you know, that's what I'm not saying it's right, but it's, he's given three sons to his country, and he said, you know what, enough, I don't care, right or wrong, I'm not going to give another one. And, and, you know, as a father, you understand that, right or wrong, you know? Um, and it's so I find it interesting people just go, oh, be nasty, patriarchal, or domineering. No, there's a lot more than that. Absolutely yeah. interesting. Yes, right here. Uh, it's just a great performance, Oscar worthy. <laughs> uh, I, I saw this one scene with Mary Jo, and I said, hope I'm not getting ahead of myself, and he should do the Paul Newman. Uh, Story someday. Um, and he's 17 million to watch. You know, <laughs> the scene with Joe. Yeah. Um, and he, you talk about the brothers being great. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you define great? Because you, it was just a great performance. Uh, he's, he's going on and on about how great you are here. And I appreciate it. And Oscar worthy. And he just wants to know how do you define great? But I mean, it's funny because, you know, I loved, I loved him, Ted's book. When he talked, when it, he wrote an autobiography before he died, um, True Compass. And, he, and the early chapters where he talks about the greatest gift he could get in a day was his father walking past him and going right in the cranberry vouchers in five minutes. If you want to come with me, be ready. You know, and, and the opportunity to spend you know, half an hour, an hour with his father was, 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 you know, was, was Ted's everything. And I felt that for all the boys in the books that you know, all written with, with Jack and with Bobby, that the immense respect they had for their father and then the talks at the tables. And I loved reading about how Jack did a tour of, of, of Europe before World War II. He went to Russia, he went to Poland. Oh, wow. You know, he, he, the family struck me as really priding themselves on encouragement and discussion and openness and, you know, and, and disagreeing, but backing it up. And, and, and so that's how I kind of look at that moment of not just meanness but I mean as a way of, of challenging him. I mean at that point Joe knows he's gonna die soon and this man is not just carrying the family legacy which is the easy way of looking at that family you know, the Kennedy name and blah 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 but the fourteen children of, of you know eleven of Bobby's two of Jack's and one of his own at that point. You know and, and I I think that in in the narrative of of, of, the, of how we think about the Kennedys um, you know, the human family side is forgotten, and and, and that's where I, you know, that's why I, I saw that 
and greatness, you know. And also some of them is Tim reaching out for his brothers, you know. Maybe that scene where I go down and fly the kite, you know, I wanted to jump it, but I, but I thought people would maybe hopefully think that that was Jack's or that was Bobby's jumper that he just kept in. You know, I don't see to put that on, even though it's summer, you know. Even though the sun's shining, I'm down there flying a the kite in a jumper, you know. Just little things that kind of hopefully you know, sink in. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's great. Yeah, sorry, there. Hi. Um, first of all, fantastic performance. Thank you. Um, when I first heard the word Chappaquiddick and that it was a movie, immediately in this politicized climate, yeah. I just thought, Patrick Jaw, yeah. another McDonald's uh -huh. movie, yeah. no interest. Yeah. So the fact that I'm sitting here is just a testament to yeah. what a great PR job you guys have done. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a testament to your inquisitiveness. Yeah. <laughs> she just mentioned if you couldn't hear that Chappaquiddick when she first heard it, she thought, what a hatchet job. Yeah. I think and a lot of people are wrestling with that. There's a great article written by Owen Whitman in Variety, like literally today. Um, yeah, please read it. You'll enjoy it. Uh, does anybody know how Ted Kennedy did get out of the car? Um, no, there were two windows that were broken um, when they pulled the car out. I got out by the driver's side window. Um, I would doubt, you know, I went in even when we, when we were setting up for the start, I went in a bunch of times during the day and we practiced with different windows open. You know, because there had to be some, there had to be at least one, I would say it would have been Ted's is my guess, that was open. For the water to come in, otherwise it would have floated, it would have been, you know, been But once you go down, you cannot open the door. Once there's water kind of around you, it was impossible even for me to try and get out the other door. And it's a very tight window. I mean, even, you know, if we had an automobile, and you know, even if the, if the buttons, you know, the, 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 the locks open, you know, your shirt gets caught on it, it gets pretty scary when you're running out of air. Yeah, right up there, yes, right in the center. I did it, but one of my first jobs in America was Brotherhood on Showtime, where I play a... <laughs> Sorry, we're right old up there, isn't it? <laughs> uh, where I play a, a Democratic uh, politician who eventually rose to be Speaker of the House. And uh, I got to know a lot of the guys over there, and Bill, who, who was the Speaker of the House, and, and you know, I always liked the world I you know, was in, and that's where I started going, you know, enjoying that. And, you know, I was there and when... Bill took me, I remember, to see young Barack Obama when he was trying to do a little tour before he decided he was going to run for the nomination. And at that point, Barack Obama was a very, um, you know, Clinton, Hillary Clinton state. Uh, and he said, let's just go and check out this young man from Chicago. So he's got to say, and there's like 17 people that's in the room with some cheap wine and bad cheese. <laughs> um, so, you know, he just kind of kept going. I, I, you know, I, I, you know, and Truly, to do the research on this, particularly Joe Kennedy, and his book called The Patriarch, it's, it's just great reading, it's great material, you know, beyond the Camelot and the, all the other stuff. It's fascinating. I mean, it, it's, it is an American 20th century. It is world 20th century. You know, it's what shaped us. Had you ever met Ted Kennedy? Yeah, no, I did. Yeah, I met him at Boat Race very quickly. In Hyannis Sports, very quickly, we were sailing one year, and somebody said, "Would you like to meet the senator?" I said, "Well, yes, I'd love to." And he had a beautiful boat, and we shook hands, and and um, that was it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Had no idea. Yeah, where that would go. No, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other questions? Yes, right up there. What? Yeah, back row. Okay, I can't see you up there because it is so pitch black. But go. Talk. No, uh, you know, I, 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 I heard that, that somebody in the office got a note from the maybe Ethel side of the family that, you know, was just, please remember these are real people. Um, and we appreciate it. It's always a good reminder, you know, that they are real people. Um, 
I was just expecting these watches recently, and there's this, this, this stuff you can read about, what they think about it out there as well. Which is, um, they really enjoy it, they're grateful. Yes. yes. And then, yeah. What, um, what was the most difficult scene for you to film? Most difficult scene? Yeah, uh, it was the scene in the, in the police station, the three phone calls. Uh, there was one day in a small room with smoke and three insanely contrasting phone calls that uh, John just punished me. I mean, you know, because I think, you know, Ted at that point is, has a lot of conflicting emotions and a different relationship to it and grief. You know, and so then when he's, you know, halfway through thanking Mrs. Kopechny and for grace, I mean, the things, you know, from his own brother's funeral and then death and then, and then both of them, sorry. But uh, so I think John just really wanted to shove it around and, and, and send me into the mental asylum and he did. <laughs> and at the end of a very long day when he had me, uh, you know, beaten up, he said, we're coming back tomorrow morning. Sorry, don't think I started crying. <laughs> that was the most difficult one, yes. This, yes. um, I, this is wonderful, so thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, this is a little similar to the moderator's question perhaps, but I know he asked you if you had theories about what had happened, mm. but I'm wondering, on a, kind of a different narrative, as an actor, you know, in order to commit to what your portrayal of it is and what your version of it was, did mm. you kind of then come up with what whatever theory or whatever narrative you were going to stick with in the performance? Uh, that's an interesting question from the point of view of an actor, she's asking, as opposed to maybe fact or different things. How you approached it in playing the truth, the truth as you saw it in playing this role. Uh, okay, two things. Before I committed to doing it, I did have to check as much of the facts that I could before I say, you know what, I'll sign off on, on doing these things. Um, and there was a number of books out there, and there's a number of uh, you didn't even read the inquest. Um, and we didn't stray from that. You know, we didn't make anything up with, with, with you know, a great dialogue of scenes, but the key moments are not. You know, we didn't go into the whole Mary Jo and what happened and stuff because it was irrelevant. Um, and then in terms of narrative, in terms of, it was more like how conscious or not Ted is of, of what he's doing. And I always found it interesting when I, like, I jumped in the water that night in April, I then walked back, I mean, I dried myself, you know, I didn't, I didn't dry clothes, I was in a freeze. I, I walked back from the bridge to roughly where the house was. And it's, a, it's you know, it's an hour. You know, and so you can feel time and what that does. And you, you understand, I mean, you can't drown yourself, you're always trying to come up for air. You know, you will try, the body is going to try and survive. The mind is going to try and justify it. Um, and so it was just a matter of sticking to John always just just play the moment for what it was like always just you know he was, he was just a, a tyrant for that don't you know don't judge the character don't plan the other than what you need to just stay in the moment and um, and it will cu cumulatively build and it did okay one or two more before we have to go yes sir uh, hey, thanks for being here. And again, I'd like to echo everyone's praise um, for your performance. Um, you had a lot of really good scenes with Ed Helms and Jim yeah. Gaffigan, who are typically known for more com comedic roles. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I wanted to know, in such a heavy movie, what was it like working with them, and did they bring any levity to the set? He's asking about it, and I thought uh, they were both great, particularly Ed Helms, who, who we've seen in so many comedies, and Jim Gaffigan as a comedian. He's saying they're known for comedy, and so what was it like working with them? Right, like, really, really good. <laughs> I mean, you know, the election was on when we were, when we were shooting. Oh. Um, so there was a lot of repartee and you know and laughter and you know and that in the truck. I mean, look, any time the most important thing is if you've done your work when you come to a shoot. But if you haven't done it, you're in trouble. If you've done it, great. What you need is, is energy when it comes time to work. And, and having a laugh is always you know, in between takes. It's always a great way of just keeping you know just letting it go and then coming back into it. You know, with, with, with a freshness and an energy. And um, they were great for that. There's also the other thing is this. this there's a slight absurdity to a lot of this. I mean, you, you know, he comes back to the house and there it is. That's, these are the guys that dealt with the Cuban Missile Crisis. These are the guys that dealt with it. You know, and you go, wow. You know, and, and Markham, you know, he's out sailing a boat, banged his knee, you know, wakes up with a hangover, and he's got, or he's still, you know, in the middle of it. It's, 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 it's almost unbelievable, this story, which is, you know, why I, I you know, 
amazing material that has never been made for the movie. It is amazing, and I thought they were very great with the screenwriters and the director to go for that dark comedy of that cabal, that Kennedy, yeah, you know, group, and it, it is, you laugh. I mean, you go like, whoa, this is and absurd. You, weed about laughing. you do, but you do laugh, yeah. you know, it's there. Yeah. yeah, It's all part of that, yes? There were some quick uh, <coughs> flashbacks of where they were implying that perhaps he did have an affair with her. What does the family think of that, and do you think that he did have an affair with her? Um, okay, she's asking about, do you think that there was an affair going on and seems to indicate, I didn't see that in the I, movie, but yeah. I don't, you know, that never really, I, I, it doesn't really interest me, kind of, in, in terms of what is at the heart of this movie, you know? Right. I mean, you'd say in a modern world, would a politician survive if he was in a car with a woman when his wife is at home with a baby, with, you know, with a child? Um, you know, there's lots of ways to look at it, but like, you know, it's, it's not for me to kind of do that. There was never the intention of going anywhere near that. Um, you know, when you see that photo of the real, Bobby and the real Mary Jo at the end of the movie, you realise what passionate, driven, committed, smart, intelligent people are. You know, that was the great liberal campaign. That was, it was going to end the war, it was going to change politics. He was young, he was committed. He'd been on a journey from you know, a right wing McCarthyite to you know, the great liberal. And, and, she, and, 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 and Mary Jo and all the women that worked were believers. You know, true believers, and he realised that not long after that photo, they were both dead. And Ted, you know, she's connected tissue to his brother, that he, that he did mourn so honestly and real. And you go, my oh, God, this is a tragedy of epic proportions. This is King Lear. So I think within that, this is not my business, and I don't think it actually says anything about it. Actually, I don't think the film implies that. There was, you can say that these two people had come together after a great boss and were spending, you know, out talking on it. But, if you want to go down that road, go down that road. If you don't want to go down that road, don't go down that road. But it's not what the film is about. No. Yeah, definitely. We have another show coming in here. So we have to say goodbye. But thank you for coming in. Thank